Hello and welcome to the Power Hour podcast. We're going to be speaking with S.W. Loudon, who has put together an excellent book called Forbidden Beat Perspectives on Punk Drumming. He is a drummer himself and author with a mission to shed light on the legendary drumming styles and players of punk music over the years. The book itself is a collection of essays, interviews, and lists from contributors such as Joey Cape, Marco DeSantis, Trey Cool, Ira Elliott, and so many more influential punk musicians. I can't wait to dig into this book with SW right after this. You're listening to the Powered by Rock podcast with your host, Isaac Kuhlman. The Powered by Rock podcast was created to help showcase some of the best rock musicians in the world and to pass on to future generations the rock music that has inspired rock fans around the world for decades. We want listeners to be able to hear great stories and life experiences directly from their favorite artists, as well as dig deeper into music theory and talk rock like no other show you've ever heard. This isn't about looking cool. It's about getting real and having a great time. Without further ado, let's start the show. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power by Rock podcast. I'm super excited to be speaking with S.W. Loudon. goes by Steve. Uh, he's actually a punk drummer and, and drummer of a band as well, but he's the author and editor of Behind uh, Forbidden Beats, Perspectives in Punk Drumming, and as a lifelong fan of punk music and I want to be drummer myself. You can see my little electric kid over there. Yeah. Um, I'm always fascinated by the history and the technical nuances of the punk genre and drumming specifically. So, Steve, welcome to the show. Isaac, thanks so much for having us on the show. Yeah, yeah, great to have you here. So first, I think it should be made clear that kind of the, what the title of the book means, because for some who may not understand kind of drumming, downbeats, what standard drumming may sound like, can you kind of explain what you mean by the term forbidden beat? Uh, yeah, I mean, forbidden beat's kind of a funny term, because actually where I grew up in Southern California, it was kind of an insult if, if somebody was playing the forbidden beat, because what it really means is they were maybe being a little bit lazy and just playing the hi-hat on the one and the snare on the two and then alternating. Yeah. Rather than keeping the hi-hat consistent. Um, but, you know, that's more of a regional thing. I really named the book uh, after the Bad Religion song, yeah. uh, Forbidden Beat. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to have Pete Feinstone in the book because he played drums on that song. Yeah, and I think from memory, the the, the song is somewhat about like a, a person lose, who's kind of looking for a way in life and it's kind of through writing. I think music is, is kind of what the storyline of that song is, correct? Yeah, that sounds right. And, you know, yeah. also it's just kind of a cool, it's just kind of a cool title. You kind of get an idea of what the book's about yeah. with the title. Yeah, that's very cool. So I was actually going to mention that, hey, it's a bad religion song too, but I was like, what if it has nothing to do with the bad religion song? Yeah. And I'd be like, well, then that was a stupid question to ask. But <laughs> I played in a, I briefly played in a hardcore punk band called the fish sticks in the early nineties. And we were signed to theologian records or the, the bass player of the band owned theologian records. I don't really know if we were signed, but we did. Gotcha. Some and uh, it was the black flag logo, but it was fish sticks. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> and uh, when I would get lazy after we were playing these really super fast, hardcore songs, which I was never really cut out to do. Um, he would tell me, stop playing the forbidden beat, stop playing the forbidden beat. So I think it just got stuck in my head, but that's funny. I think a lot of people, think of the forbidden beat more as this sort of American version of hardcore beats, like yeah. a fast oompa beat yeah. versus like, you know, the D beat, which is a more emphasis on the ands and writing on the floor tom and the cymbals a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's kind of hard to explain because you just kind of have to listen to the different styles of the sound and, and just here's the audio. Unfortunately, I don't have the audio to be able to do it. <laughs> and I'm not going to go sit back there and try to do it because I'll probably make a fool myself, but uh Let's uh let's kind of explain like what kind of drew you to putting this book together because I know you've been doing some other writing and some obviously some other editing and stuff like that but you know uh, I, you actually came recommended from to me from Marco DeSantis who is another historian of of especially California music and rock music and punk music so it was kind of just like this nice like linear extension of what Marco's already been talking about but to have you kind of on here and kind of come from a, a different side and a different angle of kind of the same story it's pretty cool to see that. Yeah, I mean, Marco is actually one of my oldest friends and lives about three blocks from me. Nice. Um, and so we see each other all the time. Funny enough, we run run to each uh, run into each other on the trails, hiking around the mountains here. I'll just <laughs> randomly be on a trail and see Marco come walking up. Yeah, um, I can always spot his his killer band shirts that he's wearing. Um, you know, the idea for the book really came from punk rock. When I discovered it, you know, I I was I had two older brothers who I was very fortunate got me into music very young. Yeah. But they were much older than me, and they were listening to a lot of 70s heavy heavy metal and hard rock, what you consider classic rock now. Yeah, so by the time I was crazy, 12 or, but yeah. yeah, but by the time <laughs> I was 12 or 13, like I'd 
seen Dio and I'd seen Aerosmith and, you know, like I, they had taken me to a lot of shows and exposed me to a lot of cool music, but in a very specific set of genres. And then some neighborhood kids played me a dead Kennedy's record when I was 12 and kind of, kind of scared me and opened my eyes and ripped my yeah. head off, you know, and I, I couldn't believe what they were singing about one, but I also couldn't believe DH Peligro's drumming, you know, just kind of blew my mind. And I was, you know, toying with the idea of being a drummer, but being, you know, exposed mostly to very technical, uh, progressed music yeah. is something that I never really thought I would be able to do. Right. Like I yeah. was like, well, I'm never going to be Neil Peart. So I guess I'll never play. Yeah. Drum. <laughs> um, but punk rock, I was like suddenly aware that it didn't, you didn't have to be an expert. You could just kind of jump in and express yourself that way. So I, punk rock has always meant something really important to me because it gave me the, the courage to start playing music. And uh, yeah. I just was, it, it changed the course of my life, quite honestly, because then you join bands and you meet different kinds of people and you go on the road and you're in recording studios. And yeah. so I felt like I owed a lot to the people and the music that inspired me to even get started on this path in the first place. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, that's the reason why I started playing guitar was a little of the grunge, a little of the punk kind of stuff. Like that's about the time when I started listening to music to like my own music versus like my parents' music or mm -hmm. even my older brother's music. He, he was a little bit more into the ska scene. He's all like real big fish, say Ferris kind of guy. And I was like, he, he's still like Nirvana in, in a lot of the punk bands, but I was more like, let's listen to the punk stuff. That's a little bit more accessible to me. Like when you listen to ska bands, they have like 13 people on stage and they're all very talented. I'm like, I can't do any of that stuff. Like I can yeah. play punk music though. <laughs> so I like um, to think that you guys found common ground with like operation Ivy or rancid. Like that's yeah, for sure. Favorite. Rancid was absolutely one of both of our favorite bands. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I was going to say, you know, one of the, one of my things that I always loved about the music was it's accessibility. Like you're saying, and in the essay written by Kurt Weiss about Jerry Nolan from the New York Dolls and many other projects, uh, he mm -hmm. highlights the drumming became the backbone through or, of, uh, through simplicity from the phrase, don't overplay, compliment. And I yeah. think that is such a key moment for most drummers, even in any other genre, to understand that you don't have to just overplay everything. So like not all punk drummers subscribe to that concept. I mean, Travis Barker, for example, that guy is the backbone by by like because he's just a rock star on the drums right but yeah. like you know tommy ramon wasn't going out there and filling everything and, yeah. and playing all these different you know different symbols and and and, and you know toms and all that stuff but um other bands of that era be, kind of came successful or famous uh because of that minimalist drumming style like you know there were like guys like ringo star out there that kind of got that concept mm -hmm. um, they didn't have to be you know you know ginger baker out there they just were like hey you know i'm not the going to be the most technical but what i'm going to do is i'm going to make the best version of the song from the drum set and i think that was kind of starting to spread through punk music mm -hmm. from a tommy ramon and some of these other guys is that kind of where like when i when i listen to punk music that's what i sat there and thought was like they're not making it all about the drums they are well aside from maybe travis barker but they're not making it all about the drums they're making it about let's make the song as good as it possibly can be from each aspect yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah, it, Minimalism really is sort of a hallmark of especially early punk rock in the 70s. Yep. And you pointed to a lot of the big names around that. Um, but even within the 70s punk scene in New York and Los Angeles and some of the proto-punk bands that came before it, there were uh, a lot of shared influences. And that was one of the most interesting things of taking this approach to the book of having all these different contributors and all these different perspectives is these kind of... Uh, smaller narratives began to pop up. Like, you know, you mentioned Jerry Nolan and Kurt Weiss's essay. His favorite drummer in the world was Gene Krupa, who's a jazz and swing drummer yeah. from the 30s and 40s and 50s, right? Um, Legendary drummer for anybody who practices drums. I mean, if you don't know who Gene yeah. Krupa is, go find him. Buddy Rich, another one. Go, go look back in those days and see how good of a drummer can be. Well, it, Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa actually made a record or a couple of records that was called yeah. The Drum Battle, right? Where they yeah. actually played against <laughs> each other in competition. And uh, But, you know, I interviewed Rat Scabies from The Damned and to me, Rat Scabies probably summarizes what I think of when I think of punk rock drumming. When you think of the toms at the beginning of New Rose, yep. that sort of like brutal minimalism. And you can just hear he's playing his heart out like he's sweating blood while he's doing that, right? <laughs> that energy, that raw energy, it's like right in your face with this loud, crazy, energetic music. That's who I think of. So when I talked to him, I was really surprised to hear it was the jazz guys. It was Krupa and some of these other guys, Sandy Nelson. Yeah. Um that really got him started, but he couldn't get drum lessons. And, you know, in the late sixties, he couldn't yeah. get drum lessons. 
and he tried to join the school band and they gave him a trumpet and then you know, yeah. he tried to join this other band and they gave him a cornet <laughs> and he's like i want to be a drummer and you know they're yeah. like everybody wants to be a drummer we need you on horn but so they 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 have these influences and of course they have like uh keith moon and they have uh uh ringo star um and you know those guys are playing to the song especially with ringo star because the, you know of the hours he put in playing in dance bands yeah. in England and in Germany, um, he's he just masters the backbeat. And yeah. then with Keith Moon, you get sort of animal, the overplaying, the crazy like yeah. he starts stand to stand up while you're playing and don't just yeah. knock all your drums over. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like right, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, it's like uh, between those two poles is where you're going to find punk rock. And yeah. I always kind of assumed Keith Moon was the guy that really would be pointed at from the British invasion. A lot of people in the book, Ira Elliott, Stephen McDonald from Red Cross, actually point to Ringo Starr as, yeah. as the backbone. So a lot of different influences. Um, and I think, you know, you you hit on something that is another thread that I saw in the book as I was putting it together, which was punk starts there, um, but it certainly progresses, right? You get into yeah. the early 80s and the hardcore scene and people like Jeff Nelson from Minor Threat and D.H. Peligro from the Dead Kennedys, uh, they're, the way you're playing hardcore beats, Tez Roberts from Discharge, um, the way these guys are playing drums is wildly different than a Jerry Nolan or a Tommy Ramone. Then you get into the pop punk era, and this is where you start to see actual like crazy musicianship pop up. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned Travis Barker. Uh, you know, uh, you've got uh, definitely Trey Cool from Green Day, who's probably playing more like the British Invasion guys. Yeah, Eric Plord from Lagwagon was yeah. a phenomenal drummer, yeah. but arguably. Uh, he was more of a progressive rock drummer. Like he was so like technically capable. You start yeah. to see it start to take off. And that's why bad astronaut was such a crazy cool band. Cause yeah. that project had him not playing punk music. And you know, the three punk guys weren't playing punk music anymore. They were just making like this really cool sounding music yeah. in whatever space they wanted to make it, which is what I talked with Marco about. I'm like, it was just an amazing, you know, project for me. So um, yeah, let me get, let me kind of come back to a couple of different things first, because um, there's so much to go through and, yeah. and I got, there's lots of questions, but I obviously don't want to sit here all day and just <laughs> yeah. waste your day away. And I know you got other things to do. So I think Ira Elliott mentions at one point, one of my favorite things about drumming, I think in the first chapter of the book, when he references, uh, playing fills and knowing when not to as well, he says, if you're a drummer like me programmed by years of repetition to make some kind of extra rhythmic comment at the end of every phrase, actively choosing to play nothing is an act of con uh, concentration and will you need to train yourself to do it or not to do it as the case may be do you feel like this is one of the most overlooked things about drumming that even other band members might not quite understand like guitar players like you know like when i grew up everybody who i knew as a musician was mostly guitarist bassist and i knew a few drummers but everybody seemed to shit on ringo Starr and say like oh he's not a very he's like by far the worst musician in the band and i'm like do you have to understand, you have to understand the drumming aspect of it. He doesn't have to be technical. What he needs to do is to complement the rest of the band. And that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. Even if he was, I mean, he could have been the flashiest person in the world. He could have been Neil Pert in disguise. And we just didn't know it. Right. So he didn't show it because he was restraining himself. And what I Ira Elliott's there saying is basically it's very, very hard to play nothing. It's like when I sit there and try to play a beat for like, you know, 16 bars straight or something. I'm like, I'm bored. I need to throw yeah. a fill in. Like, I need to play something else. I'm like, it's like you have ADHD all of a sudden. You just like want yeah. to start moving around the drum set. But what do you think about that? And then what what, what kind of is your take on that? No, I think, I think Ira's right. You know, uh, this is the second book that I've worked on with Ira. And, and I've really gotten to know him over the course of his writing and working with him on his essays, but also doing some podcast interviews and just getting to know him chatting online. He is such a devoted Ringo Starr fan and is so knowledgeable about Ringo Starr as a drummer and about the Beatles yeah. as a band that I always learn something when I talk to him. And I actually think he's 100 percent correct. Like when you think about minimalism as a musical approach, if you're playing a whole bunch of notes all the time, uh, it just kind of like you, you, you kind of confuse people and overwhelm them yeah. and they're going to be blown away by your dexterity as well. They should be. If you're good at it, you're good at it. Yeah. And if that's the way you express yourself, that's the way you express yourself. But it's much more difficult to play a minimal number of notes and make them count because yeah. everybody can hear every single note that you're yeah. playing with perfect clarity. And I do think a lot of drummers, myself included, especially when I was younger, there is that sort of boredom factor or like I would do a roll or hit a crash cymbal 
just to count, like to remind myself yeah, where like, I was in the we're song. We're on the eight right? beat now. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the roll. We're going into the bridge, right? Yeah. And and I think you know that I learned some bad habits young, being primarily self-taught. But I do think that like drumming is funny because even people who don't play drums seem to approach it from a technical mindset, no matter what, right? Yeah. They're blown away by the technique, by the physicality of what they're doing, by how fast they can play or yeah. how many drums they hit and, you know, and yeah. how, how many cymbal flourishes they can do. And then certainly that stuff's super exciting. I mean, you see somebody do it really well, you're kind of blown away by it. But at the same time, there is so much energy that comes from somebody like Tommy Ramone, who was never a drummer. Yeah. Um, Joey was the drummer and they told him to sing. Tommy was the manager and the producer. They could not find a drummer that that uh, had Tommy's vision. So he's yeah. like, fine, I'll just play the drums. And he played drums like a drum machine, like yeah. really, really <laughs> straight. But with, if he, if try to imagine somebody on that first Ramones record doing a ton of accents and rolls, yeah. I don't think it would be as good. So he was yeah. just the right drummer for that band. And I think that's more often the case is you got to yeah. be the right drummer for the band that you're in. Well, and I think for punk music, a lot of it is what it looks like and sounds like live as well. Because like what happens on a record and what's recorded may sound like not as enthusiastic. Because then when you watch him do it live and you're going, holy shit, this guy is just pounding these things for like th two, three minutes straight and not stopping. You're like, that's insane. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, I, I've certainly had, like I said, I, you know, I saw Motley Crue when I was really young. I watched Tommy Lee play, and he's a guy that was playing a lot of stuff, a yeah. lot of fills. Um, and I've even seen punk drummers over the year, who, over the years who, like, again, I saw Lagwagon uh, because I went to school in Santa Barbara after high school. I saw Lagwagon very early on, and the minute that I saw Derek play, I was like, what is that guy doing? Like, that had no relation to the basic one, two, three, four yeah. kind of caveman drumming that I do, that I did then, and I still do now. <laughs> yeah. uh, seeing him, I, and I, because Joey Cape's a friend, I, I've, I've talked to him about it, and and he just said that was the guy that Derek was, and that is how he always expressed himself with drumming. And it's it's hard to deny how talented he was and how much yeah. that added to the, the the band. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I will speak to to, to Derek and and, uh, yeah. and Joey's uh, article about him in a minute, but uh, I do want to back up because there's I kind of want to just speak about the drumming as a and Trey Cool kind of breaks it down in four stages. He he talks about basically you need um, the elements to be a really good drummer is you need pocket, you have to be a little unhinged, you need hooks, and you've got to play the song. And he mentioned basically learning, you know, the unhinged part from from Keith Moon, the playing the hooks and the song from like Ringo Starr, and he learned pocket from ACDC, which I was like, kind of, that was like a little odd for me, because I was like, you know, they're really, really tight sounding. And I can imagine if you actually play that live, you'd start to feel pocket and, and, and understand that like, now I'm actually getting in a groove of a song because it's such a tight, like that band is tightly structured in every aspect that they do. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty, I was pretty curious about that. And I was going to ask you like, what was your kind of first, you know, maybe you didn't even know that you were experiencing or whatever, but how did you kind of first learn or, or, or experience drumming pocket? Um, I, I honestly, as a young drummer, I was kind of more interested in making noise and causing chaos. Yeah. It, it, sometimes it takes you years before you actually feel like that is clicking, right? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the guys that, that that I got into, and I, I was always really into Charlie Watts. I mean, that was a drummer that oh, I yeah. really loved. I, I loved Stephen. John Bonham. Uh, I loved the Bob, the first drummer from Devo. I, could never really understand what he was playing. I was convinced it was a machine. Yeah. Then you find that's out what I thought too for like yeah. years. I was like, "There's no way that one dude's playing this," because I just thought they were just in the studio, just all hitting different stuff or something. <laughs> And then for some reason, even though we grew up in Southern California and like I went to the same high school, although some years later where like Black Flag and the Descendants went, you know, and, and Circle Jerks, um, for some reason, my little crew of friends got really into the Minneapolis post-punk scene. And so we were really into Husker Du and the replacements and Soul Asylum. Yeah. And uh, I think that's where like I started to understand musicianship and pocket a little bit more because... Yeah. They all had their own styles, like Grant Hart from Who's Could Do. Nobody ever really played drums like him. He like swung the ride cymbals a lot. Yeah. Um, Grant Young uh, was a very, uh, the guy from Soul Asylum was a very idiosyncratic drummer. Like there's, yeah. if you listen to their first couple records, uh, he's playing in weird time signatures that they yeah. often don't get much credit for. And that was a yeah. really talented live band when you saw them back then. Yeah. He was always a really interesting drummer. And then you had Chris Mars, who 
as another example of a guy who just no one's going to hold up as like a paradigm of like incredible drumming. But you can't imagine the replacements, especially on those early records with anybody else. He just understood yeah. what Paul and the band were trying to do and what the Stinson brothers were offering. And he complimented them and he played the songs really well. So I think it was probably when I got into those bands that I started being aware that like I had more of a role than making noise and like, you know, yeah. bumping people out. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, yeah. So like I, I grew up, I was a guitarist from age 11 and pretty much still I'm, I'm still playing guitar, but I do play drums and kind of started playing drums in high school when I started to put a band together. And I was like, my buddy left his drums at my house. So I would try to play everything and then have them, the parts ready for them to all play. Mm -hmm. So we could just make the music and show them how to do it. But um, you know, when it came to basically like uh, you know, when I actually drum for a band, it was uh, about five years ago. I did it for about two years. Uh, I actually, worked with a guy who did comedy folk songs kind of like they might be giants yeah uh or a band like that and it was very weird because i was like punk and rock and grunge and i was like all right how am i going to do this because like when you started when you started talking about how ringo Starr was talking you know from dance beat and and and, and you know the backbeat of the of the beatles was kind of like that's how i approached this band i was like all right i've got to fit my style in here because i'm not going to be able to play anything else but i got to make it make sense for this as well Mm -hmm. So then I started putting that together. The singer was like, holy shit, we've actually got real music here. He was like blown away that like you could put a rock beat to a comedy folk song and it sounded like a rock song now. And he was like, this is incredible. So, you know, I think it was one of those things that basically changed my mindset about drumming too. that when I started actually doing it, I was confused about like how people did it before until then I actually did it. And, you mm -hmm. know, Rats Gabe was talking about bringing different styles not necessarily listening to his contemporaries uh, and finding influence from those punk drummers. He was like, I found my influence from these way other genres. Right. So I think, uh, you know, I think most bands, most punk bands are more defined by their drummers than their actual lyrics in that sense of like the sound. Um, I think John Robb also detailed that in this, in the essay from the book as well. So I'm curious as what your take on that is, because I think it's a totally underrated trait. I mean, I mean, it gets back to that, like playing the song, right? Like I, I, I've been a drummer in, in several different bands or projects or trying to start bands and they fizzle out after a couple of, you know, practices, like what yeah. happens when you're a teenager in your early twenties. Um, you know, when you click with the band as a drummer and when you're contributing and when you're serving the song in the way that is benefiting everybody and kind of raising it up. You also know, and I've been this guy, when you're detracting, like your drumming is not right, yeah. <laughs> the kind of music that they're trying to play. I think people know it intuitively too when they see a band or when they hear a band recorded, whether or not the drummer is the right drummer for the band. And, you know, like you take an example of like John John Marr from uh, Buzzcocks. He was mm -hmm. like a 15 year old kid when they got him. And in fact, the, B -B the D beat kind of starts with him with this song called You Tear Me Up. And he plays it in this kind of idiosyncratic way that ends up helping create this whole genre of punk rock. But he says in interviews that it's just because he couldn't keep up with the tempo of the song yeah. and he had to find a way to get through it, right? Yep. So that's very punk rock, but it's also like, he was thinking of the song first and foremost and how he was gonna best contribute and serve the song. So I think it always gets back to that. And I think when you listen to music, more often than not subliminally, you're gonna understand if the drummer is playing that vital role that a drummer can play because yeah. you're gonna respond to the song kind of differently. Songwriters I've spoken to about this will often talk about the alchemy and the magic of, I got the whole band together, I had the songs, I had the band name, I had the whole vision, we couldn't find the right drummer. And yeah. then when they do find that right drummer, that's when things turn a corner because they yeah. finally got that solid foundation to build on. I 100% agree, yeah. And I, I remember setting like a mantra for myself basically when I started trying to play the songs i was like you know uh much like tommy ramon i was thinking like don't overplay or whatever right but i was thinking like play something that fits the song even if you don't know how to play it yet just practice it until you can actually play it because i was like you know I, I knew i never was gonna be the fastest drummer like you said you're not gonna be neil pert i knew i was gonna be mike mike mangini not gonna happen <laughs> dave Grohl, travis barker they already existed so there's no way i'm gonna get that in like a couple of years time it's just not gonna happen so I actually drew more inspiration from drummers like Zach Lynn from Jimmy Eat World mm -hmm. uh, and Jason Finn from the President of the United States of America do their timing, technique, and tightness. And then I was just like, I'd sit down and just listen. I'm like, they're actually just playing off time beats sometimes. And that thing just fits whatever the sound is so well that I was like, I don't have to be fast. I just have to be different to make something stand out. 
and people will go, Oh, that's really cool. And I don't even think it's really cool. I'm just like, I'm just trying to fit the song. I want the song to sound cool. And then when drummers will look at it, they'll go, that's actually a really cool beat. And I'll be like, Oh, thanks. I'm like a crap drummer. So that's like the biggest compliment in the world. I mean, you know, from all the things that I see drummers, they don't understand that they don't have to be the guy. They just have to fit and make something cool sounding. And, and that was one of the things that when I actually got compliments, you know, Hey, your timing's really good. Or, Hey, that technique on that song was cool. I was like, well, that's amazing. Cause I barely know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think, but I think that that's one of the best and most endearing things about punk rock and punk rock drumming in particular, even if that's not what you were playing. Yeah. Uh, the kind of music I was always playing punk rock. Nobody, nobody else in the band was, but <laughs> I, you know, Rat Scabies kind of talks about this in the interview I did with him where, you know, I asked him if there was any relationship to the punk rock that he was involved in in the seventies initially and what's happening today. And he says, you know, it's very different. Um, and you go and see guys and you, you kind of can't believe what, the, what they're doing with their feet and their double pedals and their quad pedals and yeah. all this technical playing they're doing. And he's like, you get blown away by that. And I, I don't even, I can't even begin to count it. Right. That's what he's talking about. But he's like, there's an interesting thing about that, which is, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, you go into one club and you see a person playing like that and you're absolutely rightfully blown away by their yeah. technical ability. But you go into the next club and the next in the next club and every person, every drummer in those clubs is playing to that level. In the fifth club, the person playing rudimentary beats that are idiosyncratic and nobody could quite play them just like that drummer. Yeah. They become more interesting. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think you mentioned Jason from the, the presidents of the United States. He's not a drummer that gets mentioned a lot in drum conversations, but I don't think I've ever seen a drummer have more fun on stage than that guy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and have like two drums. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but that was their whole shtick, right? Like, yeah. their whole shtick was sort of like, you know, stripped down gear. I think the guitar player had two two strings on his guitar. Yeah, like um, three and two, yeah, something like that, yeah. But but he's the right drummer for the attitude of that band, yeah. right? Yeah. So, like, that's that's kind of why, you know, this is like, it's a matter of personal taste. Like I've mentioned, Derek Plord's amazing. Travis Barker's truly amazing. Brooks Wackerman, when he played with Bad Religion, was truly amazing. Josh Fries is like an incredible drummer. And these guys are yeah. all technically adept. Where my heart is, is with the loose and kind of still learning, brutal, minimalist drummers. You know, the, yeah. the Rat Scabies, the, the John Mayer, uh, Mark Laugh from Generation X, another drummer that doesn't get pointed to a lot. Yeah. I like the way I, you, you feel like you hear him learning um while he's playing on those songs and there's something really endearing about that yeah well i think i think that's always something and another person that was always learning and we'll get back to it now is is derek plurid like that was one of the things that joey cave mentioned about him was the dude was taking lessons <laughs> as a well, i wouldn't say famous drummer but like a pretty well respected drummer he was still taking lessons uh, unfortunately passed away early but i do want to get and talk about derek plurid because this guy was literally like the drummer of my childhood for leg wagon. And then he, you know, was bad astronaut with, with Joey as well, but he also did the Ataris. And I mean, he, he was the backbone of some of the best punk music that I knew of when I was growing up. Um, you know, Joey basically mentions that the way he explained Derek's mentality was he was building, right? So he was like, he was naturally gifted at like making things and he was like building something and he was always learning and trying to become better. And then he said, for lack of a better term, he was the soulmate of his music. So like soulmate of music for, for Joey Cape that they fit together so well and so easily um, that they just gelled, um, you know, Rats Gabies, you mentioned that as well. He mentioned like bands like Led Zeppelin and Cream and The Who, when they just knew that like, you know, the singer, guitar player, whatever, and the drummer just gelled, uh, they get you and you get them. And, and I was just curious, have you ever felt that in your career? Um, but we'll get back to, we'll get to that in a second, but let, just tell me about Derek Plurin and, and your experience with him. Cause in my opinion, I, I, I didn't know of, like, you know, smelly from, from a no effects was another big guy that I was like, man, this is kind of the, the, one of the best drummers I've heard in punk music, but the way that Derek played wasn't necessarily the fastest or, you know, the, the tightest for punk music, but it was the most intriguing, I think, out of all that. Yeah, I mean, again, those those the common running themes that happen when I put this book together. Uh, Rifle by Lagwagon is a song that everybody points to because Derek's opening playing on that was unlike anything people were accustomed to in punk rock yeah. up at that point. Because again, he was technically adept. He was he was pretty advanced for a, a punk drummer, and he was willing to take risks and he was willing yeah. to play things kind of differently. And I think that really fit where Joey was coming from as a songwriter, right? Because Joey was also never a straight one, two, three, four gutter punk kind yeah. of guy. He always yeah. had 
you know, some other influences, metal and other stuff and, and classic rock. And, you know, he's got really great and broad taste in music. It just so happens when those guys played together, it came out as punk rock or yeah. their version of skate punk. Yeah. You know, uh, I never knew Derek very well. I met him once or twice. He was always just sort of this figure that loomed large in, in the scene up in Santa Barbara. Yeah. If you were a drummer, he was very hard to ignore. He was also in the times that I actually met him, a really cool, soft-spoken, hilarious dude. Yeah. I mean, like really funny dude. Um, and uh, just a talented monster drummer. And that's another example of Joey found his drummer, right? Like yeah. Joey found the guy that was going to help him take his music to the next level. And I, I think doing the book, I went back and listened to a lot of the lag wagon stuff and the, and the bad astronaut stuff and was blown away all over again. Right. Like yeah. was completely like shocked at stuff that I had forgotten that he had done on some of those records that I, I still find impossible to even wrap my head around. So like yeah. <laughs> my praise for Derek Ford, it couldn't be any higher. Yeah. Very cool. And have you actually felt like, obviously you, you, you drum for the band czar and um, you know, have you felt like when you, when you guys play together, it just was like a natural gel. Like you knew exactly the style that you were going to play. It didn't have, it wasn't like a struggle. And have you ever been in the counter situation where you have sat in a room and gone, this feels like not going to happen. <laughs> yes. Um, I, uh, so czar is a band that I joined in around 1998. And we put out two records, one with Hollywood Records uh, in 2000 and then one with TVT Records in 2004 or 2005. And uh, these days, Zar doesn't really record. We did one more EP in 2013. Mm -hmm. But the lead singer, Jeff, and the bass player, the other Jeff and myself from Zar, have a power pop band right now called The Brother Steve. So, yes, I have that connection with Jeff Whalen, who's the lead singer of Zar. Um, I really understand his songwriting. I understand yeah. his influences. Um, he knows what, what I excel at as a drummer. He knows what my limitations as a drummer are. He can kind of write songs to the way that I play drums. He doesn't need a drum machine. He knows what I'm going to play to them. Yeah. He's been playing and recording with me so long. Uh, for the brief period that uh, I left Czar in around 2005 before the second record came out, briefly, I just needed to clean my act up and it was t time to take a break from drumming, which I had been doing for 20 years. Um, I did briefly play with another band. And uh, I tried and I tried, but it just didn't have that same magic. Yeah. Uh, and good for them. They did find a drummer who was the right fit. And I moved on and they moved on. Um, and ultimately, when I wanted to start playing again, I was you know, dabbling with the idea of playing again. There's no question in my mind that I was going to play with Jeff Whalen again, because, again, we have that symbiotic relationship. We know each other really well. Yeah. Um, and it's it's hard to manufacture that if you don't have that history with somebody. Yeah. And I swear it comes down to more like do your personalities as people fit more than do your styles of music fit? Because I have a, I have a friend that played drums for years and years and years. I actually wanted him to I actually wanted him to play bass for me in a band. So that way we could start a band because we didn't know any drummers, but I didn't know any bass players. And he'd, he'd never played any music. So I was like, all right, I'll buy you a bass. I'll I'll own it. You can play it or whatever. And then he was like, you know what? I think I want to do drums. So then we co-bought a drum set together. And that the minute he started playing drums, I was like, no, nah, we're you're playing drums. You're gonna do this. Like he he just got drums way better than he got bass. And since that day, like I was like, man, if I could ever just play in rock bands with you, that that would be awesome. But uh, we've always lived in different cities and it never worked out. But I'm like, we could sit down right now and just wail through like 60 minutes of playing and be like, that sounded like nobody i've ever played with and i know that it, it works for a lot of other people and a lot of other bands mm -hmm. so i think it's very interesting when that happens because most people don't really get that in their in their life either it's something so it's you tend cool. to want to hold on to when you find that connection with the musician yeah. i mean i would say the same thing about the bass player you know drummers and bass players have a sort of magical connection yeah. or they should or they need they to have to be i mean they're the rhythm section right <laughs> yeah they need to be locked in but they also need to be you know there's there's a the level of trust right because it's really yeah. on the two of you to hold the base of the song down yeah that everybody else can go off in, in every direction you know and propel the song forward and add dynamics and all that stuff and there's a lot of uh, unspoken communication that goes on between drummers and bass yeah. players and uh, the bass player from czar and who's also in the brother steve is still one of my closest friends and and i i swear I have a really great friendship with him because of our background in drums, drums and bass, yeah. right? Our musical relationship has now gone forward and it's flipped and that's what's informing our day-to-day -day in real life friendship. Yeah. Um, you, you, can, you make these really personal connections uh, around music, whether you record or tour or do anything with it, you just know when you're connected to somebody and it's, it's a really magical feeling. Yeah, I think one of my favorite things, anytime I see like a, a concert, 
when you see the bass player turn to the drummer or the drummer turn to the bass player and they like just smile about something, you know that something wasn't supposed to go that way, but then they just kind of made it happen together in some way that was either cooler or, you know, by accident or they, they managed to salvage it back together. But you know that something just happened there in that moment that only they know about and nobody else does. Yeah, they're usually laughing at the guitar player, just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but there's also like there's a there's a, a running joke in drum circles where like you know what what's the first thing you do if you drop a stick or or miss a beat is you just turn and give the bass player a nasty look and everybody thinks you made the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why'd you hit that? No, that was out of yeah. that was out of beat. Like, yeah. You made me drop. We're, a we're stick. skipping that one right now. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. Another one, another good story in the in the book is from uh, Jim Rowland, who's actually the uh, co-author of the new book, Corporate Rock Sucks, The Rise and Fall of SST Records, where he writes about Bill Stevenson of The Descendants, who if you ask any punk drummer, he's basically like the godfather of like modern pop punk, hardcore pop punk, melodic part, hardcore, all these different genres kind of branched off of like Descendants and his drum style. Um, and one thing I always notice about him, like if you ever see him play live, He's like one of the smoothest fast drummers you'll ever see. And the phrase I hear, you know, I, I think Neil Peart was one of these guys too, is like, there's no wasted motions in what they do. And I think in, in one of the sections, he says, uh, you know, Stevenson himself says that the good drumming, the key to good drumming is a consistency of pressure as opposed to erratic flaying around. And I think that's right. I mean, if you want to be a good drummer, you just need to be precision with your, you know, drum, where the, where the sticks go and all that stuff. But I'm like, doesn't it look way cooler to flail around though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was always definitely much more of a flailer. I never yeah. <laughs> had control of a uh, Bill Stevenson, but yeah. it, it's true. You watch him play drums. Like I, I saw the Descendants, geez, uh, I think 2019. So before the pandemic started yeah. at the Palladium here in Hollywood, which is sort of a legendary. And he's no thing. spring chicken. I mean, it's not no. like he's 25. <laughs> Those guys have been doing it for a very long time, right? Yeah. Um, but they still play incredibly fast they still go song to song to song to song to song right there's not a lot of stopping in between yep. the songs and you're right bill sits behind his drum set and his body stays pretty motionless it's yep. pretty centered but his limbs are doing all the work yeah right there's this economy of motion um but his playing is unbelievable and, and you talk about influences when i go back and i the rare occasion when i go back and listen to anything i've recorded um it's bill stevenson that i hear most often as the biggest influence in my drumming, yep. the, the single stroke rolls, the surf, the, the surf beats that kind of come out of nowhere. Um, it's what I grew up listening to between Bill and, and Agent Orange. Um, so I, I, uh, I always uh, tip my hat to Bill because I, he's like my favorite punk drummer of all time. Yeah. An incredible songwriter on top of it. Yeah. And the fact that the descendants are still doing it and they're still so good. Like if you, did you listen to ninth and Walnut? I did. Yeah from way back in the day like they brought yeah. these like unre like unreleased recordings and yeah it was it's was, it's one of those things like it's 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 so unique in the sense that like here's what we did before we were descendants basically and then they're going to bring it back 40 years later and you're like well that's interesting like yeah if you're a true fan of descendants you might not like it but if you're a real real fan of the people of descendants you'll probably love it and and then that's kind of where i was i was like i love it because it's not quite their music it's not the hardcore scene yet but mm -hmm. it, you can see how these like surf songs and these other things are kind of leading up to where they were going and it's like some pretty interesting stuff in there yeah i mean you know and the surf thing was always there if you listen to a song like get the time or sure. something you know he bill's playing surf beats like pretty yeah. sold up um but they also like i also give them a lot of credit for basically inventing what we came to understand as pop punk they're That's sort of right. like the, grand, the godfathers of, of pop punk so they were never like against a hook right yeah. and, and i gotta be honest like i grew up around some like pretty hardcore dudes and you know they always wanted to listen to black flag and i liked that stuff but i was always kind of quietly the guy who was like ah, i like pop hooks a little bit yeah. you know? <laughs> so, like, yeah. when pop, when i like to be able to sing a little bit into the song and i don't have to just scream and chant and yeah. bang my head yeah <laughs> no and there, there's a time and place for that so, I mean, i'm not, I'm not yeah. saying i don't love black flag i definitely yeah. do and i love the circle jerks and i love the dead kennedys or doa yeah. or my threat um but 
you know, I, I just, my, my personal taste always ran towards the poppier, right? So yeah. uh, a band like the Descendants kind of were able to do both for me. Yeah. Um, and, and even though I kind of had to hide that sometimes, like when I got even poppier from yeah. some of my friends until pop punk came along and then it was all kind of out in the open. It was like, it's cool yeah. to like- And punk. then join Zar and you're like a glam rock pop, yeah. pop band and you're like, whatever, like screw you guys. <laughs> well, I mean, look, if you're, if you're a musician, I was never the most tried and true, like, I was certainly, I like to say I was never the most punk rock guy at any backyard yeah. camp party. That was, you know, I like music. I like punk rock. Punk rock gave me a lot of permission. And I always think of it as my home base. But I mean, you know, within two or three years, I was like listening to the Velvet Underground and the Violent Femmes as well. Like, yeah. you know, I could, I could go to Fenders and see Seven Seconds play and have no problem going to see In Excess the next weekend. Like, yeah. I just love music. You know? Yeah. I mean... I, that's one thing I think about the punk scene is those those gatekeeper guys that are like, oh, you're not punk if you don't just listen to this only and you dress like this only. It's yeah. like, I wear cargo shorts. So I'm like, I'm not going to go to a freaking mosh pit. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm going to get murdered. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to listen to the music and I'm going to be a fan. I don't have to act like you to do that. So it's one of those no, things that I think a lot of people misconstrue about. Oh, no, you know, it's, 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 it's people's intensity and they, they put their energy into this stuff and you can understand why they have these intense feelings about it. Sure. It's an intense scene, you know, and and scenes mean different things to different people. For some people, it's just the music. For other people, it's their entire social life. Yeah. Um, and so if they're going to have a different feeling about it, that's totally cool by me. I'm just going to be yeah. over here in the corner bobbing my head and don't exactly. worry about it. Get out of your way. <laughs> yeah. And I think at the end of almost all the interviews, you asked uh, the interviewee what advice they would give someone coming up in punk drumming right now. So I'm actually going to ask you the same question. What would you say to someone coming up in punk music? Or punk drumming right now specifically if they were if they're starting to get started right now uh if you have the inclination to play drums in a punk rock band or a rock band or just want to play drums with a band uh get something that resembles a drum set it could be a drum set it could be fl flipped over trash cans it could be pots and pans and start a band with your friends tomorrow the best yeah. way to learn uh in my opinion and the most magical and memorable experiences i had even if the music was terrible was getting in a room with my friends yeah. and and working on something together and making you know beautiful noise together. So I always tell people like, don't wait. You don't you don't need to be good. Just go find people that are at your level and find a place that you can make some noise. Yeah, I mean that's the punk band I had in high school. I will say we were all mediocre, uh, but somehow we made music that was somehow better than the three of us could be. <laughs> I was like. Yeah. It, it's good to us. I don't know if anybody else likes it, but it was always like, we were like shocked at how good the songs came out when, when we wrote the songs, because I can't do that. If you're not in like, you can't write those songs. You can't be that energetic. You can't do what you want to do unless you're around the people that are kind of in that wheelhouse with you. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, they, they, uh, the answer to that question was really interesting because there was a lot of similarities and what people said, like Bill Stevenson basically just said, you know, don't try to sound like me. Don't try to yeah. sound like anybody else. Try to sound like you. That's great advice. Yeah. I think Lori Barbero from Babes in Toyland says something very similar. Um, Rat Scabies was very interesting uh, because he brought it back to people. And, you know, I think that there is this sort of like spirit of the original punk scene in what he said, which is um, you can always teach somebody to play, but you can't teach them to have interesting ideas. Yeah. And you better like the person you're in a band with because you're going to sit in the back of a van with them for nine <laughs> hours a day. And, you know, yeah. that's actually really true. Um, some of the longest, best, and most memorable friendships I have in my entire life are people I made music with because we went through something together. We created things together. And yeah. even if you never release a song or a record or go on tour, those experiences, those shared experiences you have together are going to stay with you your whole life. Absolutely. And I mean, don't expect to be rich and famous for a long time, if ever. So yeah, just, just cherish the memories because that's what like I always tell people, like, I don't want to be the guy that has the most money when I die and rather have the best stories in the nursing home before I die. It's like, th those are the people that I want to be around is just people that are experiencing life and actually having fun. Yeah. And it's interesting too. You know, it's like, it's something that I challenge myself about, you know, now that I'm, I'm in my early fifties. So it's like, I have less and less friends who are doing artistic things that aren't a sure bet. Right. Just yeah. naturally I have families. I got jobs. It's totally fine. But any of my friends who show any glimmer of like, you know, leaning towards wanting to do something creative. I'm like, do it right. Yeah. Because you don't see as many older people taking risks with art or I don't, uh, in yeah. my personal life. So I always encourage people, you know, never stop. Right. It's something that, uh, I met a guy who played studio drums at the Capitol records building in the late sixties. He was like a percussionist, wow. a session guy. You wouldn't know his name, but, but, um, 
I was talking to him about that scene. And, and when I met him, he was in his seventies. And he said, uh, I said, what's your, what's the secret to like, you know, cause he's so passionate about it. I said, well, what's the secret? He said, never stop creating. Don't yeah. ever stop creating. Even if it's just for you, yeah. don't ever stop creating. So like, that's another thing I try to say to people is like, there's no age limit. You can do whatever you want. I mean, if you're going to be punk rock in the first place and there are no rules, how punk rock is it to just do stuff that only 20 year olds are supposed to do yeah. when you're 65? Exactly right. I think that's, you know, the spirit of why people keep doing it. I mean, yeah. I think somebody from no effects, I can't remember if it was Fat Mike or somebody is like, we're not gonna be able to do this forever, but we'll keep doing it as long as we possibly can. And I'm like, why not? Like, if it's fun, and you don't hate what you're doing, keep doing it. Yeah, so, I, I really hope they do. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So thank you, Steve, for being here. Obviously, we'll add some links to the books and the, the, the show notes below this episode. And, and you know, mention this and shout it out on, on social media, and everything. But do you have anything you want to listen, uh, you know, mention to the listeners that has yet to, be, you know, find you before we go today? Uh, no, I mean, thank, Isaac, Isaac, thank you so much for having me on the show. I've been listening to your back ep episodes. The podcast is amazing. You have yeah, really you. interesting conversations with people. So hopefully you'll count this as one of those. And yeah, for sure. Um, if you do check out the book Forbidden Beat, uh, not about me, but about all the contributors. Every time I look at that table of contents, I am totally blown away and and can't kind of can't believe that all these people gave me their time and energy. So read the essays. You're going to find some of your favorite new writers. You're going to find some of your favorite new musicians. You're going to find some of your favorite new drummers. But next time you listen to punk rock, pay a little bit more attention to the drums. For sure. For sure. Awesome. Thank you very much, Steve, for being here today. An awesome conversation. If you haven't checked out the book yet, it's Forbidden Beat. You can pretty much find it. I think it's on Amazon. We'll put some links there below in the show notes as well. If you like what you heard on the show, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends on social media. You can see the full video interview on our YouTube channel as well. Also, if you want to check out some of our written content or any of our products or merch we have available, go to poweredbyrock.com to read our absolutely free rocking blog full of album reviews, interviews, and lists to keep you entertained. And find our gear as well so you can pick up some items to look and play like a rock legend. That's our show for today. We'll see you soon for the next episode. Until then, rock on. supposed to be